You are listening to a White Phosphorus Pictures podcast. Broadcasting under the night sky from the edge of an undisclosed jungle on the Gulf of Mexico, I'm Christopher Garitano, your voice in the night. For the next hour, allow me to be your guide into the bizarre unknown, the fantastic macabre, and together we'll journey to that borderland between fiction and reality, a place beyond all rational explanation. We are now off to the witch. This system makes of us slaves, without dignity, without debt, no? with a devil in our, in our pocket, this, this incredible money in the pocket, this money, this, this, this shit, this nothing, this paper who have nothing inside. Movies have heart, boom, boom. Boom, have mind, have power, have ambition. I wanted to do something like that. Why not? That was from an interview with the great surrealist Alejandro Jodorowsky, speaking passionately about what prevented him from making, perhaps, a motion picture that would have changed the course of cinema history. It was his version of Frank Herbert's Dune, devised to be a psychedelic science fiction epic and an intentionally subversive outlaw movie that was almost made with an enormous budget within the Hollywood system. It was a counterculture proposal of originality and a mind-expanding experience that we can only now and forever imagine. Outlaw artists share the common trait of individualism but their personal journeys are entirely unique. And not unlike Jodorowsky, tonight's guest comes from an environment of turmoil, chaos, revolution, crime, obscenity, and ultimately expression through his various mediums. We'll hear his story after this commercial break. After these messages, we'll be right back. You are listening to the Off to the Witch podcast, where we explore that bizarre borderline between fiction and reality and all subjects arcane. Journey over to my YouTube channel and subscribe now at youtube.com slash at Off to the Witch for a variety of extras and special features, including the Off to the Witch mini docs with further insights on many of the latest episodes, as well as previews and behind the scenes of my forthcoming investigative series series Off to the Witch presents, as well as the anniversary edition of my motion picture documentary Montauk Chronicles. And follow us on social media. All links are available at linktree.com slash garitano7, G-A-R-E-T-A-N-O-7. And stay tuned for more Off to the Witch. Mark of the Devil. The desecration of human mammals less than 300 years ago. It's your sacred duty to tell us the truth. Confess, confess that you've been guilty of witchcraft. Tortures pitting human appendages against the strength of cold, brutal steel. The rack, the claw, the tongs. Devices that made death a welcomed pleasure. Every torture device authentic, actually used at one time. Mark of the Devil, positively the most horrifying film ever made. Guaranteed to upset your stomach. This city is now being flooded with stomach distress bags. No one will be allowed in the theater auditorium without these free bags, also available at the theater box office. Mark of the Devil. All ages admitted. Parental guidance suggested.
Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano. And tonight's guest, Shane Bugby, is difficult to define in few words. What is outlaw art? It forever expands and evolves. It obeys no rules and follows no trend. It never aspires to be like everything else. It's pure and speaks of authenticity. It often shakes the world. Shane Bugby has lived an extraordinary life, speaking to our eyes and ears with controversy, energy, provocation, texture, and color. His journey is from counterculture and obscenity to comrades of crime, debauchery, and the devil's notebooks. If you're not already familiar, I encourage you to seek out Shane's work and his series of books at shanebugby.com. So, here's my interview with Shane Bugby. And it is it becomes hard to introduce myself because I I feel like I'm just a person and you know being noticed is almost a byproduct of a capitalist system or something like that. I don't so it it becomes uh you know you you're presented as a special person. And I do think I, I'm a special in a lot of ways, but but it's like I do believe I'm a, a snowflake. Let's say that that the popular term, iron snowflake, though, like a Chinese star, like I'm razor sharp snowflake. So go ahead and fuck around and find out. But I'm I am unique. But I'm I'm just like doing my thing. I just I'm I'm being pulled along on this path. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't create a career to be a counterculture uh, person. Uh, and I would say icon, you know, that's what I'm called. I, it's weird to say that, though, but it's the way it goes. You know, I, I have had made history. So I, I like to be sort of joke about that and say I'm historic. When I play with you, it's it becomes history. And that's the truth. But, you know, it's, I'm sort of making a joke too about it, but it's, it is the truth. So, right. but, Do you think that's the case with most people who were uh, defined as that, like throughout history? There, any, anybody that's like this counterculture icon, it's usually they're doing their own thing, and it's other people that end up writing about that stuff. It certainly seems that way. I was talking on a, a, a stream last night with Sharon Levan and stuff, and we we're talking about, or maybe it was some interview. Let's let's just say I was talking to someone, and talking about the special, what LeVay did, what Anton LeVay did, and how it had, people try to duplicate that all of the time, but they can't. And I think the reason he can't be duplicated, the reason he became, he, what he did, what he synthesized, and him, his image, and that moment in time, why it's so, why it became so historic, and why he's become like a person that'll be remembered for a thousand or thousands of years, is that it came from his individual. It came from, yeah, from that magnet that drug him through this, this, this situation. Cause he, he was so many things. He was a fry cook. He was a working class person. He was an artist. He was a piano player at, at vaude, you know, he understood what vaudeville was. He understood what burlesque, burlesque was when it was seedy, when it wasn't pop culture. And so he, that individual, whatever he was sniffing around, he, whatever he was interested in drove him. He didn't go, I want to be this. I've always grown up to want to be famous and and create something that's not only going to be make me famous, but going to put me in a cage, uh, a cage like I, you know, he, he, you had, he had to be uh, afraid at some point. And I understand, you know, like that's a hard thing to say about a Satanist. But yes, we, we have a, when you become a public Satanist, there is a fear to that because people want to hurt you. Or people think it's okay to hurt you because you're a Satanist, it's okay to rip them off because they're going to, you know, like, yeah, I stole from the devil. I, I fucked over the devil. I conned the devil. So it's like, it, it becomes on another a weapon that, that stuff becomes weaponized against it, it has for me. And I've seen, I understand the LeVay's uh, I, I'm friends with all of the LeVay's. Well, I should say I've spoke with all of the LeVay's and I'm friendly with most of them. So rewinding back to, and this was 69 when Anton LeVay created or forged Satanism. This is a guy who did something wholly original and even, and at that time, probably infinitely more risky, correct? Like it was. Forget about him. Let's talk about me. You talked about my beginning of my life. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sort of joking. I I love Anton. I love Dr. LeVay. But I'm just saying, like, I just was using him as an example. I don't mean to. I, I, I was born in Lubbock, Texas, is what I'm trying to say. You know, when you talk about the beginning of my life, I was born in a trailer in Lubbock, Texas, and my parents are, my parents were not that educated. And so, 
you ask where where you asked a lot in your question, so I'm I was like my mind is swimming in that. I think the open so far has been perfect because it says a lot. And so going back to Lubbock, Texas, when you were a kid, uh, can you just give me a memory, something that really struck you? And it could have been a commercial on TV, a cartoon, something that happened outside of okay. the house. I was so young then. It, so I went back there, let's say 15 years. When Obama first ran for office, I did a road trip called A Year at the Wheel. And I went around the country for a year documenting things. I understood I was studying like... I was a publisher, so I understood publishing was going to online and everyone was going to have their own TV channel and be their own publisher. So I was sort of obsolete at that point as a publisher. So I wanted to go around and say, this is the last time I'm going to be special as a documenter or, or you know, a publisher. So I, I went around the country and filmed people's stories. And one of the stops I made was in Lubbock, Texas, where I was born and raised. Uh, not raised. I was born and raised for a couple of years, a handful of years there. And so we went back to the trailer park where I was from. And it was weird because they had all these chihuahuas still running around. They had all these chihuahuas running around the, the dog park. The, I mean, the, the trailer park. And I was named after a chihuahua named Shane. Yes, funny. And, and so, I, you know, I, but I kept picking up this red dirt, the clay on the ground, this red Texas dirt. And I was talking to my partner. I'm like, this is what I can't get this. This is like familiar to me. And my partner's like, it makes sense. You were a child. You were probably playing with the dirt. But the, that red clay of Texas, the dirt, it was a dust bowl. That's what was familiar to me, you know, um, in that trailer park full of chihuahuas that were all descendants of the chihuahua I was named after. There you go. And that's amazing. And the, the, you're giving me texture of that. And was there music of the time that you recall at that young age or is it is it too well my dad i could tell you this i remember my dad watched horror films and i remember one time he woke up and i had a butcher knife in my hand and i was motioning to stab him in the chest but i was using the wrong end i was using the dull end not the sharp end. i was like whacking him on the chest with this knife and he woke up and because i watched that on tv so i thought it was play you know like this <laughs> alfred hitchcock stuff and so that's uh, media I remember, but he, I also remember the Rolling Stones. He played the Rolling Stones a lot. And, and here's the, or, or this song, which he sung to me all the time when I was a baby and up throughout my childhood, which is uh, how Eric Burden's House of the Rising Sun. There is a house in New Orleans. They call, that, that song is my lullaby. That was the lullaby my dad would sing me to bed. Weird song too. <laughs> Does that, okay, so and this is interesting. So sometimes a smell or a song, uh, you know, like uh, that Seals and Crofts song, Summer Breeze, I must have heard that a lot when I was a little baby because that brings me way back, you know, for some reason or a certain movie. Why do you think that is? Why does that trigger all of those senses and kind of you transport back in time? Well, the mind's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You know, I... I, psycho, psycho, your your mind. It's just the way it goes. I, I wish I understood the science of that, but I think it's wonderful. I love uh, to go back in time like that with a food or a memory. I, I, in my older age, I have a lot more negative triggers. So there are some things that I had to eliminate from my life because they were such a trigger. And a lot of, I, I had a, had to, had a divorce. And so anything from my, I had a long marriage and anything that any music that we had shared and most everything that I could not listen to anymore. So I had to start engaging with like musicians that I'd never listened to, like David Bowie. I'd never listened to him before. And so I started listening to him. I'm like, wow, this guy's great. And then I listened to Brian Eno now. So I have a whole, my, my audio library is so different than it was five years ago, let's say. So is that a way to conquer traumas by expanding into a different direction? It was for me. I, you know, I, I just knew what upset me and I wasn't going to have any more of that in my life. My life is too short. So I was like, the minute I heard something, it triggered. I'm like, yeah, that's done. I'm not listening to that anymore. Yeah, that, oh, you know, and I lost a lot of my favorite bands, a lot of favorite, really great stuff. And if it comes on my shuffle on accident, I walk over and skip it because it brings back those memories. And it's like, I, life is too short. I just listen to something that has no attachment to those emotions. And, uh, you, you know, and that's fine. It, it's, a, it's the way I can survive. And it's the same with meals. Maybe I, you know, 
meals like my, you know, I have issues with a lot of things. So let's say a meal my mother would cook me. Uh, when I'm friendly with her, I crave that stuff like chicken and dumplings and gravy and greens, Southern food. Uh, I crave it. But when I'm not talking to her, I can't stand it. I don't want, you know, she's we, we, tumultuous relationship, uh, you know, and, and it's the same with my, my past life with the partner. A lot of the, any of the things we enjoyed together, I have no interest in, in, in partaking in them anymore because it brings me back to that moment. And, and, and it's a moment of betrayal and pain and, and stuff that is just hard to, to live through, let's say. Those, some of those things are hard to live through. And not so, to force these memories back at you, but going back, what, if, you, if you can share it, if it's comfortable. When you were a kid, what was the thing that broke comfort? What was the thing that really, and it, you know, kids get injured, kids fall down. I don't mean that really what was the first thing that you saw that kind of revealed a much darker dynamic to the world? Oh, wow. That's interesting. The first, the first thing that popped in my mind was, uh, find the cabinet of, it's interesting. I'm a publisher. The cad, there was a bookshelf we had, and then the two, there was two locked cabinets at the bottom and I was a pretty smart kid. So I figured out how to pick the lock on them and get into these books. And I found books on, uh, there was one that was about cr true crime, you know, like uh, and it's a popular book, Murderers, Mad Men, and Crazies, or something like that. And it was about killers and serial killers. And then there was like the hundred one sex positions and some sex books in there, and and that. And then and then this is pre internet, so people are people might not understand this. And then I would then that that also led to me finding pornography in the woods, like in a box. There was a box, and I remember opening it up, and it was real hardcore pornography. And, and finding, and then finding hardcore bondage pornography in my father's under his mattress, those things were jarring to me and, and interesting to me. And so that's the first thing I can think of that I saw. The first thing, you know, that I can think of, my father was very abusive. So being beat up by a big person is pretty hardcore. You know, it's pretty scary. And, and so that definitely changed my, took it, my innocence away, you know, pretty quick. Yeah. And, and, and continuing to, okay. So, and here's the thing, this is the odd thing that happens. You see those things and you're disgusted, but there's this odd attraction too. As you were getting a little bit older and let's say getting into 12, 13, did those things, that curiosity increase and did you dive into other things by that age? Are you saying I was disgusted by seeing pornography? Well, I mean, we found, you know, young boys at, at that time, let's say in the eighties, you know, hanging out with your friends, we found, uh, magazines in the woods. I don't know who was having that stash, but we found some stuff in the woods too. And we weren't disgusted, right. but it could be jarring because you'd never really, that, that would be arousing. But then again, some of the bondage stuff when you saw as a young kid, did that assault your senses in a negative way? No, no, I was, I'm just, I was a, I'm a, I'm I have, I think differently, you know, you could, I, I had dyslexia when I was younger, whether that's from trauma or my mind is wired differently. I've always just been curious about things. So like it's same with Anton or the serial killers I've interviewed. Um, I, I'm just curious. So I want to ask the source questions. I didn't, I, I have a hard time. I became an entrepreneur because I have a hard time staying employed because of however I think. And, um, and I've gotten my, and I've had a hard time staying in school because of how they're structured. Not that I, I want an education. So my education's come from doing thousands of interviews. So it's like all that stuff did is make me curious to the point where the first time I had an orgasm was watching a Seika porno, you know, and I was like, wow, this thing works in a weird way, you know, my penis. And, and then eventually I worked up to working with Seika, like, you know, <laughs> doing an event with her, court of, you know, court, the court of porn and, and working with her. So that was just a, my curiosity has led me to meet all of the people that I was curious about when I was a child. You know, I was, I, when I was curious about what serial killers were, true crime, I interviewed, I worked with John Wayne Gacy. So I've had that, that's where my life becomes maybe exceptional as I didn't stop. I just kept trying to figure out what's going on here. What's, what is this? Why did my parents like this? What, what's going on? And, and it, that sums up my, you know, under trying to understand human nature, 
what is this? And why were my parents like this? Why was I treated this way? Why do I act this way? You know, It's interesting too, because do you think being exposed to essentially sex and violence at a young age actually forges a maturity that is unlike the people who are restricted from it? Because in other words, I've seen, I, I grew up with things available to me and my parents had a video store. I saw so much and um, they didn't seem to have an issue. And I never was compulsive or wanted to hurt people or the, the, the thought of rape was not even in my, my makeup at all. You know, it's not possible. But there are kids that I knew that were very restricted that ended up murdering and doing other things too. Um, do you think being restricted from those things could could forge a, a, a darker interest in it? No, I don't. I think that's part of your character. I'm with you. Like even fun rate, like if I have a partner, it's like you want to be roughed up, stuff like that. That is uh, outside of my care. I can do it if they're enjoying it, but I, I, uh, it's outside of my character. Um, and I've studied that stuff plenty. So yeah, I don't, I think that's, uh, something, you know, I've never, when I've hurt people, like in fights, when I was younger, stuff like that, I went home and cried and to, you know, I've been through enough therapy to realize like that, that is just not what I want. That's, I don't find any satisfaction in hurting people or seeing people hurt. I have a real problem with it. So I think you can be affected that way. I was affected the exact opposite way. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, idealistically, I would love to be a pacifist, but that's a hard thing to accomplish um, when you live in a in around in and around violence. You know, you and you taught violence as a young age. That was my what I was taught, and that so throughout my younger days, you know, I'm old, a lot older now. Throughout my my mid twenties, you know, if I had a problem with you, I'm going to smash your fucking windows out. I'm going to fuck you up. I'm definitely going to go for your throat. But that's what I was taught. That's what I understood how to deal with the situation. I knew no better. When I saw that I wasn't getting what I wanted that way, or that way, that was a very temporary sit- solution to a to a situation, you know, intimidation, threatening, hurting people. I I didn't like the outcome. I want I I'm a person who wants to be loved, uh, and I, and I'm an artist, and I'm a prolific artist, and, and there's a reason for that. I can't be loved enough. I could have a hundred thousand lovers and that's not enough for me. And I think in the same regard, you could say it also, it created a monster that is like that. Like I can't be loved enough because I wasn't loved as a child the right way or at all. And so it's like, I want to be seen. I was ignored. I want to be loved. I wasn't loved. It's not that I want to act like my father because I despise that person for now. Not any, you know, he's passed away. I, 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 man, Going through therapy, it's, I never thought I would ever try to forgive that guy, but I and even my mother. But I do, in that respect, like I get, like I under, I see things in a class perspective now, and I see how hard life is for poor people and working class people, and how hard it is for them to have an obligation with a child that they didn't want, you know, that or they thought, you know, and and they're in the Zoomers, you know, I mean the Boomers, and and they had this obligation, they they couldn't get an abortion, they couldn't, it was socially unacceptable. And, and coming back home, I remember talking to my mom and I go, you didn't want to have kids, did you? And she goes, no, I didn't. You know, and I go, you did this to get out of the house, right? Because it's the only option women had. She's like, yeah. And I was, you know, that's the facts. That's the facts. Her options were to marry the first dude that would take her seriously and have children. And that's how she was going to be taken seriously in society. And that's a really sad state of affairs, you know. And I, I, have, I, have, I have sympathy for them because of that, I have forgiveness for them because of how society has, has been set up. Sure. Because, you and know, you know it firsthand. My question is, do you think, see the, the, the so-called leaders in society in a lot, in many cases, I don't want to say it all, uh, clearly have not been through those type of traumas or had to live or struggle. I've met so many overprivileged people that have so much to say, to dictate. They're very hypocritical. Right. And how other people should be behaving and allowing certain things and, um, freedoms in some cases and others being stifled, but they never lived that life. Why is it that you, that we're being told by people that might not be as strong 
that have dealt with certain things and even overcome them because the thing is you can deal with it and you can turn into an animal. You're still not strong, at least in this society. But if you've overcome it and you've gotten control over yourself, then that's true strength. These people may have not ever experienced any kind of um, self-obstacle where they have to overcome this thing that was forged in them in most cases, because I've listened to them speak. How do you feel about how the world is set up and it continuously dictates to the people who have been through those traumas and had to overcome them? As yeah. It's inexperience, no? Well, I think the, the people you're talking about that maybe haven't gone through the same things, they, they, they go through the societal traumas of being accepted into an Ivy League school, of, of learning how to speak a language that will alienate the, the poor people that don't don't understand these big words uh, can't understand it can't understand why this person's in a suit and tie all the time uncomfortably dressed so they they conform their animal into something that that is is way outside of our society it's funny when i see rich people vacation they <laughs> their vacation is living like a poor person they're sitting on a porch eating a burrito or fishing or they got their shoes off walking on the streets uh, and the, in a tourist town so they're <laughs> they live a, they spend two weeks of their life living modestly like a poor person in the woods or camping <laughs> sure to realize their humanity and then they go back to the grind and they're they're in the, in this these conf, this their cage which is is a is a is a, a class their class and they feel superior to the poor person for most of their year, because that's how our society is set up. But, but they definitely come down to reality that, you know, whether, wherever they're vacationing, whether it's the mountains, the woods, the, the, the beach, they, they, they come down to our, our level. They eat corn on a stick or whatever. They go to the fair. And, and so it's like, uh, and, and we have the same issue. We want to, we want to wear Gucci, you know, Gucci sells to poor people, not rich people. And we want to feel we want to feel like them. So it's a really strange situation we've created. Sure. And, but but I I would rather be in with the poor folks and the working class folks because how I see it is we have more fun. You know we don't have a problem having sex and and you know having these pleasures that rich people seem to have to hide away in sex clubs or with with. Uh, uh, sex trafficking or prostitution, stuff like that. Well, we don't really have those issues. Right. Behind the scenes, it seems like they might even be worse because they have to, you know, for their own public image. And I suppose at some point you were attracted to assaulting that hypocrisy or that lie because there are too many people telling it. I mean, you know, um, I spoke to a... Uh, U.S. Marshal, U.S. Marshal's uh, psychiatrist. I went to D.C. once, and he would not obviously say the name, but he said there was a political figure that a lot of people know that they're trying. He's been raping women, and he's they're trying to fix him, almost reprogram him. I mean, this guy was legit, and we couldn't believe what we were hearing. And um, that's the kind of th people that are leading the country. Yet, the unlikely people. The ones that on the forefront, you would say, not a chance, I don't want to hear a word they say, might be much better leaders. Do you agree with that or disagree? Oof, I'm not sure I like leaders at all. Um, but I do agree with you. Like, like when people hear these things online and it sounds outrageous, you know, like sex, sex crimes with these politicians and stuff. Oh, it is so true. I worked in the pornography industry. It is so true. The, the, the levels of, um, just criminal sexuality that that rich people engage in because they can, because they have the money or power to do that. And so when you hear these stories, it, you know, quite often there's a truth to them and they're so outrageous for the common person that they sound made up or paranoid or something like that. But I got to tell you, I know pretty firsthand that a lot of that stuff is true. <laughs> um, and, and so as far as leaders go, that's a real hard situation, isn't it? I was a Bernie Sanders fan for a long time. And with the Palestinian stuff, I've really been turned off by a lot of things. Uh, 
in, in the conflict, all the conflicts we have over the all over the globe, the slaughter we have of indigenous people all over the globe has just gotten on my nerves. And so, but my I also understand it must be a real precarious situation for people who are peaceful, like a Bernie Sanders, to have to operate and have to negotiate people's lives, have to negotiate lives. So I, I'm not. I I think when we're talking about leaders and stuff like that, I I my imagination goes beyond this system. I want to try to imagine something that isn't this. I think this is, and this being this society is so corrupt and awful and ugly. There is no fixing it. We can imagine our way out of it though. We can imagine our way flying through the air and we, we do, we have planes. We can, we can imagine something different. And as this thing is breaking, as we're in a collapse of society, we should be imagining what's next. What, how do we do the next step? And, and I don't know if it has anything to do with what we're doing now. And even the exchange of money, we can imagine something else. And why aren't we? Why do we keep sticking to, let's fix this. Let's talk about this. Why? I don't want to keep talking about the leaky, the leak I have in my bathroom. I just need to figure out how to fix it. And, and as a poor person or a working class person, sometimes I don't have the money for a plumber. So I have to get creative and imagine a fix for that. And, and that's where innovation comes in. And I think we need to start using our imagination more. And that's really been beaten out of the working class. And it's so much so that they see artists as deadbeats or lazy or non-essential. And that is really the crime. Uh, I see a real, I, but if I were to have a religion, it was, it would be art and creativity and the imagination. I think that's where it ta- that that's what takes us to the future. And, and there is an impending threat overall but i think it can be stopped um and i and i want to get into that i want to learn a little bit about you as an artist when did you get inspired at what age did you get inspired to say something through your art when when do you, when did you recognize that what you were drawing or what you were writing was actually speaking something strong to its potential audience oh goodness the very first thing that comes to mind, I want to say all these grandiose things like the Picasso down in Chicago. There's a lot of things that I could think of. But one of the first thing that comes to mind that is hard for me to express is that I remember drawing pictures of being bullied at school and showing them to my mom and her telling me to toughen up or, you know, quit crying about it, what, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I, there, there was a recognition, even though it wasn't what I wanted. And before that, I was, I, you know, no matter what was being said by the teachers, about, you know, like Shane had to go home be, because he tried to hurt someone with a pencil that was bullying me or whatever it was, that, that there wasn't, there was no communication to me. And so when I presented drawings, people would look at me and communicate to me. And I remember I went to court for the first time. That was all that was, so that's where it started. And I, and I, it followed through to the point where my innocence started to go away from this was I was put in jail. It, it, like I just turned 17 charges as an adult. And I went through this court process and a public defender got me off of a class X felony. And I made her a ceramic pot. And then I saw her like 10 years later, I went through this court system, you know, for a traffic violation. She saw me in the hallway and she brought me to her office and she said, look at what I look at every day. And she had my ceramic pot center of her visual where she sat in her desk. And she said, I look at that every day and think about how, how important it is to give, to fight for people to have a chance and not go, you know, to, you know, to have a chance outside of going to jail. So she, you know, cause that were, I was sentenced to, I was, I, I, uh, pled guilty and, and the, the, the deal was I'd go to jail for a year and not a year and a day where I wouldn't go to prison. And the judge, she fought so hard. She went out to lunch with the judge. The judge overturned the state's attorney's decision and said, no, he's going to get probation. He's going to get parole and he's not going to go to jail. And we're going to give him a chance. And so I gave her art and, and I remember giving her that pot and she looked at me and smiled and almost cried. And so with artwork, I'm seen and I'm heard. And that's what I remember. And that is one of the greatest examples of art that I've heard 
anyone say to me and the purest as well because you can have an illustrator that can draw the creature from the black lagoon every scale exactly the way it looks verbatim but the true art is what starts to move change you your feelings your depth you can't forget it and it can take any shape and it and it's a mystery too it's a total mystery and it can come from any culture anywhere around the world and does and that's art and it in and, and its infinite ways to move you and so and personal expression it has to be unique to you um not to jump ahead too far but do you think all of the above everything i mentioned and things i haven't mentioned are threatened by artificial intelligence at the moment no not at all that's a ridiculous concept we have always a problem with new technology. When the internet first came about, I was the first person online and everyone was like, you don't want to get online. Don't get on the internet. They're going to, the, the feds are going to monitor. They're going to have a mic in your home. If you put the computer in your home, don't put a computer in your home. Go to the library and use the computer. Go to your, go to your friend's work and use their computer, but don't put it in your home. So I heard the same bullshit with that. And they heard the same bullshit probably with the phone and the wheel and the fire. Oh my God, he made fire, smash his skull in. You know, the guy, the first guy who brought fire to the tribe got beaten and killed probably. So it's like, it's, it, AI is a tool. I love using it. And, and it's like when I was doing stuff on, uh, when, when, when I was first online, I understood this was going to corrupt my publishing. You know, I was, and when the internet took off, I was like, wow, I can't, I'm no longer important. Just like I said with that road trip, I knew to go out and film now because people will take my camera really seriously. And in another year or two, they won't because they'll have a camera too. They'll know how to edit video. Right now it's magic. And I remember there's this great quote about filmmaking. And I don't know who said it, but it's like, until filmmaking is as affordable as a piece of paper and a pencil, it will not become art. And I think that's true of all of this. The problem with AI is that rich people have control over AI and they're going to decide how it answers, how it works. And so they, for some reason, they can have AI for themselves and it can do anything for them. But for us, the simpletons, we can't use it to whatever, make soap, make a bomb, whatever, whatever they're trying to stop us from doing. And I loved when AI first came out, I would ask it questions about legal stuff and it would answer. And then I would ask it something else and it wouldn't, it started to not answer and say, oh, you should see a lawyer. And I'm like, you know, going on chat, Why? And it would give me these bullshit answers. And I go, but you just, you never gave me the, and I forget what it's called, pro, pro, pro. do you know the name for when you, you, you are your own counsel? Um, um, well, when you represent yourself in court? Yes, there's a technical name for it. You know, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, pro, it's something, but let's say it's just like, a, you know, there's a technical name for it. And I asked the computer, the AI, why didn't you suggest this? This, and I, I used a special term, but let's say I, I said, why didn't you suggest that I could represent myself? Because I can legally represent myself. Why? W oh, and then the AI started to make excuses for it and said, I should have. And I, but, but it was trained differently to not give me that because ultimately AI was going to destroy lawyer jobs, accountant jobs. And I think that is really the goldmine with AIs. The more white collar people that are destroyed, the better then we can have a real talk about universal basic income. We can have a talk about poverty and poor people because now white collar people will be poor. They're not going to be able, you know, your college education ain't going to do shit for you now. You know, AI is, taking, is going to take that from you unless the college educated, of course, control it. And so we, they can still have their jobs and we can use it to win the, the Jeopardy uh, tournament on TV or whatever people can, are afforded the luxury of using ai for but it's a tool it's just a tool i love it i i agree i mean like i think as long as you're very interactive with it like for instance um ralph bakshi's awesome movie wizards the animated film from the 70s um mm -hmm. it was all rotoscoped which it was drawn over live action or, or a lot of his like lord of the rings but with ai within a few years we know, you know, in, in reality, as independent movie makers, we can't afford that. We can't afford to pay a fleet of animators, but you could shoot all the live action scenes and make something like that with AI. 
That's what I see with the new, so I think, I forget what it's called, Soros or whatever, the new uh, video. Right. It is wonderful. And I see my imagination is going crazy with like, man, please give me 30 more years of life. I want to play with this. I want to make a film. I can finally make a film like I want. It'll do what I want. Now I can do it. The technology is here. What I've always dreamed of, I want, I can do now. And I don't need a million dollars. I don't need your help. No, with with a with about a hundred grand or less, you can make a movie that looks like it's thirty million, probably good within the next five years. Right, and, and so for me, for me, like the internet brought a freedom to me as a, I, I'm a plumber, I'm ditch digging. So when I went into self publishing, I was still printing. You know, there was still printing presses and stuff, and it was really hard to distribute stuff. We had to drive around. Uh, me and some of the cartoonists I did, we have to drive to town to town to sell comic books. Then eBay came about and it made distribution possible. Like, wow, people want our stuff all over the world. This is great. And then, you know, the internet happened and I did, I no longer had to have a radio person's permission to talk about myself on the radio or what I was in, thought important. I no longer needed a newspaper to give me permission or do a story on me. I could do it. So it's very empowering. The technology has been very empowering. I think Steve Jobs is like one of the Greek gods. He made computers really simple for people like me to use. You know, Apple was really simple back in the day. So I was like, oh, this is great. Not like the computers that were really hard for me to get on and understand. And so all of the tools that were that that are trickling down to working class have, have helped us. And robots will help us realize universal basic income. And that will free up human beings to be more imaginative on what society could be but we don't have the time to be imagine it we don't have the time to imagine anything everyone's working six days a week <clears throat> and barely has time to rest and, and get the dishes clean and cleaned up for the ne next work week so it's a really hard system and, and we could use some robots actually i i agree on that level i think there'll be just like anything people that would just use it nonchalantly and it's going to make garbage or things that we're not really interested in but people like yourself that have been forged and have a texture and, a, and an imagination will know how to use these tools to do something that will blow your mind. Yeah, man. And it also gives me, you know, for me, I want immortality. I want to fucking be around forever. And AI affords me that chance. If I can load in all of my PDFs, all of my audio interviews, all of my videos, if I can load that in there, I'm here. If I pass away, People that are into my work can go there and see and make artwork like me. You know, they can see, oh, let's let's see what Shane would have did with this in his style. Boom. So it offers up a, a, an immortality. And, and so I love that idea. I love it. You know, when I did that road trip for a year, I made sure to get all of my material to Internet Archive. That was really important to me. So I gave them all the raw footage, all the text, everything. And it's up on... Uh, it's called a year at the wheel on internet archive and you can find all of it and my full film and the full book. And, and that was important to me because I was like, it's like handing the Ming vase to a rich person. The only way an artist's art survives is getting it to rich people. They can afford to house things. My artwork given to my friends that ends up in a thrift store or in a garbage can because they're evicted from their apartment or something. And I, you know, I don't, you know, that's a drag that poor people can't hold art. Like I sculpt. And because of a divorce, I've been brought down to a, a situation where I'm like, wow, I'm realizing, wow, sculpting's a rich man's game. I have to store this stuff. It's going to cost me money. Wow, this is this is not cool. I have really cool sculptures. What do I do with these? You know. Do you think in the advent of things like Etsy and um, because it's very popular to decorate a home now with paintings and sculptures from something like Etsy, and some of these artists are doing pretty well on there. That must be a threat to the previously mentioned rich people, uh, one way or another, unless they're banking on Etsy. Um, is is that the beginning of a very positive change in the world of art? Things like Etsy, using AI to its fullest, things like that. I don't know if Etsy has any 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 stake in the game. Actually, I think that they sell to working class people and they sell more craft stuff than anything. Real artwork is is from poor people and it's culture vaults by art school students and they own the art galleries and they curate the art galleries with more people from art school so it's basically a watered down version of what's actually happening when you see graffiti selling nikes that was stolen from indigenous poor people let's say real poor people street art 
artwork comes from people who haven't an idea of how to communicate their emotions or haven't the opportunity to do that or are downtrodden and have no one listening. It's not these college educated assholes that are going to film school or going to art school making this stuff. They're, they're, they're trying to represent us. They can't. I don't need, and, and now I don't need you. I don't need them. I'll make my own fucking film. The best film on abuse that was made was made. It's called a uh, precious. And when I saw that, I was like, holy fuck, that is the real deal. And it's never been made before like that. Never have I seen something like that. And that's because it's a bunch of rich assholes interpreting our stuff. It gets watered down. And I'm not saying rich assholes can't make a decent film, but they should stick to making it about rich assholes, like how the, how the cake forks used. Right. So people who are interested in the counterculture, I pretty much trust them no matter where they come from, because something happened to them. And even if they were just raised by decent parents that said, you know, you, you are, you are lucky. And I've met some people who have had no hard times, are rich kids, but are sympathetic to the struggles of the working class. And I would say like Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn from the Weather Underground. Those people were rich kids. They got away. They were on the Ameri- Bernadine was on the 10 most wanted list. She's walking away around free. She got what a couple years in jail. You know, she didn't have a hard time because they came from money and wealth and education. But they also were one of the people that are saying the only way we're going to have any kind of revolutionary moments is rich kids on the front lines getting beaten. Not black people, not poor people, but rich kids that are have a, f- a father that's a professor or a mother that's a judge. When those kids start taking the, the hits, then things change. And they put themselves on the front line, blew themselves up and blew up other people rich people and politicians with bombs, actual bombs, planted one in the Pentagon. So these people really risked everything and they had everything. They had the money. They had every opportunity afforded to them. And they were like, I do not want to participate in the system. So I have respect for them. But when I talk about rich people and and coming in into to the uh, neighborhood and stealing graffiti to sell Nike shoes, that's a, a brutal truth. Culture vultures are real and they are my i one of my biggest enemies is the culture vulture i I, you know it's 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 a real i think it should be an actual crime There are those who say that this quiet town holds many secrets. Legend has it that beneath this very tower, a dark force had its eyes set on the children. We were told that what was going on there was for the benefit of humanity. What would you say to the people who say, well... All these children were kidnapped and murdered and you were a part of it. What would you tell them? I did approve of it, but there was nothing I could do about it. They wanted a large number of programmed boys to be used for mind control operations. And there are others who say it's still happening to this day. I don't know, I for myself find it a little suspicious that all the evidence has been conveniently destroyed. Let's put it this way. If you're sitting there with 20 guns pointed at you, what are you going to do? Whatever the hell they want! Watch Montauk Chronicles now for free on Tubi, Plex, Roku, and available for download on Amazon and Apple TV. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. I 
I agree. You know, what would, all right, first, I wanted to ask for an audible only show, if you could describe your own artwork, and I'm not asking you to be pretentious, just tell me in texture, your feel, how you feel when you're creating something. If you were to describe it audibly the best you can, because obviously art is a visual thing and then affects you, but d describe it to me. Well, I describe everything I do as sculpting, whether it's words or not. I don't call myself a writer. I say I sculpt with words. So everything, I, I believe everything is in layers. Your food, everything you create is there's a layer, a layered effect. Sometimes it's minimal and sometimes it's a lot. And so everything I do is layered. That That is first of all. And I do a lot of fabric art. I do hard sculptures. I could, I, you know, I'm a master artist at this point. I've been doing it for 40 years or more. So I can make anything out of anything. Tell me what you want and you'll have it. Tell me the music video you want and I'll film and, and edit it. I can do anything and I can do it pretty well. And if I can't, I go to a professional and say, help me tune this up. Help me make it tight. You know, sometimes you need a professional to make it look okay. So with artwork, there's so many layers to the presentation artwork. Pure artwork is different than a presentational artwork. So if I present something and I have to present it in a public way, I sometimes have to go to a professional and say, I need to, you went to school, you went to art school or you went to uh, filmmaking. So I need, I need you to put your, the, the language you learned in school on this. So the people like you can read it and understand it because I can't speak your language. And so I'll need that help. But I, but, but I can get the, the foundation of it layered. How I would describe my what, you know, artwork, a lot of stuff people see is based on commerce. So it doesn't always make, it's, it's design or it's, 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 I'm using the tricks of art to make money. But my real artwork, I can describe in words. It doesn't have to be seen because it's my intention. There's an intention that has to be involved with artwork that is that is beyond yourself it's it's or it's so far down inside you you don't understand it and a lot of times when i start sculpting and stuff i'll, I'll out of nowhere have all these emotions and i don't even know what the hell's going on i'm playing with clay and i'm having a great time but something's going on in my subconscious and it's, 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 it's like magic. It's like when, with magic, deep focus, you get into your subconscious, you stare into the flame, let's say in the occult world. And like, sometimes I'll just start crying or I'll, I'll sculpt for a night and I'll go into the studio again and look and I'm like, wow, where did that come from? I don't even remember doing this. So it's, it's, it's transcend, it's transcendent. It's, it's a transcendental. It's, it's, um, it's a, it's real magic to me making artwork, how I would describe my stuff, I guess in, with words is raw, um, brute. I'm a, I'm, I'm from Chicago, the home of the brute artist known all over the world for brute artists. Like a, a Wesley Willis was a friend of mine. So we're all self, what they brute artists is self-taught working class art. So we're, we're of course, uh, discounted into this category of not artists, but brute artists. I'm a brute artist. I've, I'm self-taught. My stuff is raw. Uh, my fabric art is raw. Um, my sculpture is raw. Or yeah, but there's when I when I make it, it's it. Uh, I I make it almost to repel people, but I make sure it attracts them. So there's a there's an edge to it. There's a fear or there's a shock to it. To anything, most anything I make that's artwork has that has that. And as I get older, I'm, I'm trying to get away from that. Actually, you know, I, I make a lot of wilted flowers and stuff like that. And it's still, they're wilted. <laughs> and I, I take that from this folklore about the wilted flower. And there's a whole story about like, when you're an abused person, you walk around wilted. And when people see you're wilted, they continue to abuse you as you know, cause they see the wilted flower walking around town. They know your, your dad did something to you so they can do that. But that's that, the true nature of art. You're only responding to the way you need to make it right now. Like, let's say Bukowski wrote in his last days, uh, what was that, slouching towards Nirvana? And then the other, um, uh, even uh, Dolly, you know, some of his final paintings were completely different than his previous stuff because you're only speaking true to who you are at that moment. And that's how I feel I am. Like, 
like a, that's where I feel I'm at. I'm at 55 years old and I'm like, I've done so such a huge body of work and it's starting to come back at me because younger people are into it and into like Le, the LeVay stuff or any, any of this stuff. So it's coming back where they, they want to talk to me about this older stuff and I, I, I appreciate it. And that's why I hope AI could take that job. Like I'll put everything in AI and you just ask that, ask the AI about myself. I don't want to talk about it. I want to, I want to move on and make flowered paintings. I want to make something different. And it, it and, and it's almost like and it's simple. I, my layers, I want less layers. Maybe I want to use more colors. I'm, I'm, you know, and so, the, you know, that's where I'm at with the, the simple part of myself, but I'm excited about trying to use AI to make stuff, to tell stories. So that's complex maybe. So I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of in a state of flux where, I, I'm, I, it's, you know what, it's been two years since I sat and wrote and I usually write a lot and I've been having a hard time writing in any real way. I've been struggling with that and I'm really not sure why. And I, I wish I knew and it doesn't, it frustrates me, but it doesn't. Cause I'm like, I continue to look at the future, not my past. I don't go, why can't I write anymore? It's like, what, what do I want to do? What is it? Where is it? Do you feel by any chance that your future is threatened uh, subconsciously by what you know is happening in the world? Or do you think this whole thing that's happening will breeze over? Well, I know when I first got to town, I first came back to Chicago uh, five years ago, and I hadn't been here in about 13 years. And like I said, I left everything I loved. It was, you know, a bad situation, had to get out of it. And when I got here, I set up a studio and I couldn't sculpt anymore. And I was like, I sat in my studio for days and I put all my materials out and I just looked at them. And I was like, and I forced myself to make these sculptures. And they're like jars with a picture of me as a baby child with my hair that I've been losing in there, stuffed in there. And then I made this, this creature wrapped around him. And it's like, it's a monster. But when you look at the top of it, you can see a flower. So it's this wilted flower concept. But it took me so long to sculpt those. And it was really painful because it was like when I spoke about earlier in this show, the music I was listening to back in the time before I had left, I could no longer listen to. And I was like, oh, no, I can no longer make artwork because I did that through my whole. I, I don't know if I can make artwork because it was all all my artwork was informed then by a by a situation that I was also in, you know, with the partner and all this. And I well, you could say a muse and I no longer had that. And I was like lost and I forced myself to do these sculptures and I got them done and it helped me get back on my feet as far as doing that stuff. And, and, but it's hard for me to sculpt anymore. I just, I'm not sure what to do next. I don't know what my next step is, you know, and then that's the truth of it. You know, I keep struggling with uh, fabric art. I really, I guess, I guess I could say that I really want to make artwork out of fabric you know, tapestries, stuff like that with sewn colors. So the, I, I guess I should say I have been working. I have these pieces of fabric I lay out and I pin them together. And I'm like, I want to sew them up with certain threads. And they're just, they're just almost like quilts, but they're meant to hang on a wall. And they're just quilts with patches of fabric that I find that I think look cool. And I start putting those colors together. So it's very abstract. And it's, that's all I care about doing, actually. There you go. I, almost making quilts. No, I appreciate it because it evolves. It's It's gone through so many stages, your work. And um, it's going to continue that way, too. Right. And that's, I guess, a scary part because I, 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 everything I've presented has a, has a vibe to it where people are like, whoa, that's scary or that's a devil head or that's that's this is wicked or, you you know, the wilted. There, there's something being said with the wilted flower. People can interpret it. But with abstracts, there's there's no, what are you going to say? It scares me. It, there's nothing, when I look at it, there's nothing there but a, a visual. But that, okay, so here's the thing, right? And this is just a hypothetical scenario. Let's say you tune into the news and some politician has their head blown up like a watermelon live on world TV. You see that chaos ensues and then all of a sudden there's this seed planted in you to respond as an artist you'll wake up tomorrow morning it'll be completely different and that is isn't that the unpredictable nature of inspiration yeah i don't know if i you know i met this old man he talked about you know you believe in politics then you go away from it then you get older and he was like 75 he's getting back into politics 
And I was like, really? And I'm at that age where I, you can say that all you want, but I'm not making anything about Palestinian. I mean, I can't believe the situation that we're in and how transparent it is, but I have no interest in making artwork about it. And I don't think anyone gives a shit. No one, you know, no one's listening and no one cares. And it feels that that's after being on this earth for so long, this long, I don't know if you could make a piece of art to change the world. And I used to think I could, I used to think I can change the world. I can do something incredible and change the world. And in my lifetime, I want it now. I don't give a fuck that a 16 year old and I have younger people come to me, ask me questions. I really, I get, I love that they're influenced and that they're, they're, they're influenced by stuff I've done or interviews I've done or work that I've participated in. I, I think that's great. But I was too. I don't give. I don't give a fuck about it because it's not going to work. You know, when they're at my age, I'll be dead. So if the world's changed, it won't help me at all. I want it now. I want universal income now. I want it changed now. I want access to fucking art supplies now. I want artwork socialized. I want it now. And I did the artwork I did when I was at my angriest was about causing it now. I want this society to fall now. I want change now. And I can't have it. And I feel like a fucking little baby about it. But I'm really angry. I want it now. And I'm really pissed off that people aren't listening and people aren't participating. And, and I, it just, I'm, I'm frustrated with it. So like, fuck you. I'm going to make a tapestry on the wall that's full of colors. Because you don't get, I'm not going to put a word on it. I'm not going to put a word that says hate or Palestine or, or war. No, fuck off. I fucking, you know, I'm just going to work with colors because colors work with me. And colors listen. And I listen to them. But that could be the most rebellious reaction you could have. I mean, um, yeah, I turn my back on it. Fuck everyone. Now, my question to you is, do you believe that this is being done on purpose, that uh, imaginations are being reduced? Um, People are into the most mediocre shit you could think of. I mean, like, you know, from a filmmaker's perspective, in my case, uh, and also yourself, we I grew up it being so expensive, it was a rich man's art. So it was so difficult for me to practice. Even in film school, it was, I was very rare. I got my hands on a hundred feet of 16 millimeter film. Now you can shoot an amazing movie with an iPhone, yet no one is doing with, no one's using the tool that they have in their hand. Now AI is even more convenient and watch people not do it then either. Very few people will. I think people are doing, it's just hard to find. Then Vimeo has a lot of cool little short films that people are making with their phones. I really appreciate it. You're definitely right about that. But I don't think, I don't think this is any different than history. It's only special, unique to us, but this happened to jazz artists. This happened to everyone. It's, it's, it's about controlling the narrative and it's extreme now because the class divide is so extreme now, you know, rich people have control of everything. And it is really bad now. It's a lot different than it was when I was younger and a lot different than the 30s. And and so there's nowhere to breathe anymore for a, a new music scene or something like that. They really clamp down on everything. You have to have permits. You have to, it's, it's really impossible for younger people to, younger working class people to, to express themselves. And, you know, graffiti is outlawed everywhere, but it's used to sell Nikes. You know, this is what I'm talking about. It's a great example. Like graffiti exists because they have no canvases. They have nowhere to do artwork. They have no, you know, so they're going to do it anyway. They're going to, ex- we're going to express ourselves. And it's like, I remember arguing with someone, well, I, I want to, I hate graffiti. They, they paint on my garage. I'm like, then give them some wall space somewhere in town. And they probably won't. They'll probably appreciate it so much. They'll clean your alleys. That's how cool artists are but you, you won't work with them. You just want to criminalize it because only you, the rich person can do it. Only you, the person who went through art school understands what art is. And that's what this has become of class war. It, 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 and I, you know, I see everything through class perspective and I can't, I can't understand how other people don't because I see that's the reality of it. And there's a simple solution behind a lot of property damage crime. It's to work with the people that are, doing that They'll, they want to work with you actually that the reason they're doing this is because no one will work with them <laughs> do you think that um so being that communication is so readily available do you think it would require kind of a revolution in thought from artists of all kinds filmmakers sculptors illustrators writers 
to utilize the fact that we can communicate with each other, that education is relatively free right now, um, to create a revolution and ignore the the way things have been shaped for people to think, because there's certainly some mind control going on, and you've even confirmed it. You said this is how it was designed. Is there a way to start a movement to, because you're talking about it. So someone like you, you have these younger people looking back at your past artwork, but if, if you talk about it louder, and I know that's not the job of the artist, the job of the artist is to make art, but someone has to do something to get people to wake up a little bit. Well, now we can get into Anton LaVey a bit. We could talk about that's been done. Like, oh, I, and I helped start the Satanic Temple as well. Like, I've got a book out called the, uh, Inside the Satanic Temple. I have to give a plug for it, right? But, but it's like that book's full of Anton LaVey, his interview, stuff like that, Carla LaVey interview. And they did, that's what, that's what it was alluring to, the, to me about the Church of Satan. I've worked with Black Panthers and White Panthers, which were affiliated with the Black Panthers. I've worked with Yippies. I was brought into the counterculture by folks that were using the tools of art not to sell sneakers, but to talk to people about turning their back on our society and creating a new one. I, I hung out with John Sinclair. He, he was the guy who started the MC5. You know, kick out the jams, motherfuckers got to hear that song everyone's got to hear that song in the in the world that is a song of revolution that song was made by people who decided to use music to create a revolution but their revolution wasn't a violence they they were they were also mentored by like john lennon who would say you don't want to you don't want to fight a violent system with violence they created it they can do it better so what did john sinclair do he said, let's do a, a rock and roll party in the middle of the park during the 68 National Convention. Let's put MC5 in there and just do a, you know, have a rock, you know, play rock and roll and say, fuck these people, show them how to, how to live. And they did that and riots ensued. That's great. They, but they, why did riots ensue? Because they wanted to have music and turn their back on what was going on. That's exact. There's a great illustration of what this society is. And so it's like, that's what Anton LaVey did. He was like, oh, you're going to call us sinners? Well, I'm going to give the sinners a place to go. Come on over here. We'll turn our back and sin like crazy. <laughs> so that concept's there. And at that time it was explosive. And don't you think it, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to state this question like I'm trying to push you to say something because I'm not, but do you think that it should happen again to that level now? There should be another voice like LaVey speaking as strong as he did to get people's attention or anybody else that was revolutionary in thought at the time, I think needs to happen now. Well, we, I think we have that and we do, it's, it, we can't keep looking to the past to, to, you can't apply the past to today because things look different. You, you, you know, like, and, and right away, people might say the satanic temple, something like that, but it's not what they, what we did and what they did was co-opt counterculture ideas like what LeVay did or the Black Panthers did to work with the system, become part of the system, become part of the status quo to get money or to influence politicians. And, and so it's the exact opposite. They use those tools to the exact opposite. But you can say uh, there was a group called In Decline, the street art group. They did the, the um, Trump statues. They do billboard alterations of people like hanging off a billboard and talking about working too much. So there are collectives, art collectives out there that are trying to do stuff. Uh, the, there was a group out of France doing women do it, FEMA, or FEMA, I, I forget the name of it proper, but they were taking their tops off and, and running into politicians to have a message. So there, there still are art collectives out there trying to, to do these things. I, I think you know, or look at look at the children that were shot up in Florida and created this whole movement and had a million kids walk on Washington. The internet affords us to do some of these gatherings in a in a and you could say um, what are they what are they called these mass gatherings flash gatherings where they rob stores. You know, I'm in Chicago. They'll do a flash gathering, and run through a Gap or a Gucci store, and take everything. Those are revolutionary moments. People frame them as something else, but <laughs> I hate to tell you, they're using their phones, flash gathering and ripping, going in stores and taking everything out of them. I love to see it. <laughs> and do you think, okay, and again, none of these are rhetorical questions. They're just out of curiosity for my own thoughts on all of this. 
do you think sometimes that 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 some of this allowance of revolution could be part of the ruse on the part of the mastermind? Is there a mastermind? Do you believe in that major conspiracy? Oh, at times, I think you can you can definitely I think that's possible. There's always infiltrators. I think any group, any any group, you can say like um, any group that's calling themselves. If you have an anarchist meetup, there's almost certainly a Fed there. Uh, same with any kind of satanic meetup, there's almost certainly a Fed there, or a plant, or someone who wants to use it to, for their own device. Uh, as long as we have libraries and and people encourage education, we can counter that. Um, but, but what we have now is the, the weaponization of like, uh, it's it, it, what I found is insane is everyone needs receipts for everything, which is crazy. I've had to have that situation. I'm like, but I'm standing They're Like, what's your source? I'm like me, well, where's your receipts? I'm like me. I was in the room. I heard it. What are you talking about? I, what do you want me to have a camera on? What are you asking for? Like I was standing there looking at, it. I get, you might not trust me, but <laughs> I'm still in the room better than you. And it's like, I just recently saw this thing where people are talking about P. Diddy and Michael Jackson and how Michael Jackson's been framed because, and it's like, no, I was wrong for that thing. I actually talked to some of the victims, a victim put out a book. I put the, I was one, I was the first person to sell the Michael Jackson police report on eBay and eBay lawyers called me and said, Hey, one of the people he would victimize is not going to get checks now because you have this online. You have to take it off or you're going to hurt this victim. That's why we're coming to you and talking to you first, because if we start a lawsuit, it's really going to screw this kid over. And so I took it down. But but people are like, where's the receipts? I don't, I don't know. The kid said so. Believe, you know, we're, you know, but but they, there's another concept online, believe the victim. But that's not happening in this specific situation. People are demanding receipts for and, and but the receipt is there's a young a young boy came and said this happened to me and it that's not the first time that happened and so the, that's the incredible part how people discount actual victims or people who are standing in the room because they don't have enough receipts i don't know maybe i'm getting off track here no no i it's an interesting conversation and i've seen i think people should be heard but the minute when the minute somebody says into the public zeitgeist, believe all fill in the blank, the issue is we've got sinister people that take advantage in every f- human form on this Certainly. planet, as you know, and they'll lie. People lie all the time yeah. for whatever advantage to get attention, get revenge, and right. it's been done. And I think now what's happening is they're reeling that back slightly because they're like, I, I think... In record number, there were people taking advantage of that statement immediately because because good people need to be heard. People that have been hurt need to be heard. But then you have these other people who are like, perfect, I can get my revenge now and make up a story. And it has happened. Oh, yeah. But critical thinking should 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 overcome all of it. And we don't really have that when we're in a hurt, hurt. When you're in a group of people, it's really awful most of the time. And the Internet is group think. So people get onto this thing where there's not any more critical thinking. So for me, I add to this, like the satanic temple arguments I have, and and I go against it. People, I hate me for this because I'm going against what they want to believe. But I was in the room. I know what was happening. I'm going to say so. And I don't care if you trust me because maybe in 50 years, long after I'm dead, you'll understand that I presented evidence for you to, to, to use, to weigh your options to, to, to go, Oh, well, this was said by this person. And and lo and behold, 10 years later, some evidence came out that is very similar to what this person said. I say it because I know it's true and I'm adding to the record. And I think that's important to do. And I think a lot of this bullshit that happens online stops people from adding to the record because they're going to be ostracized. So we stop information from coming forward, whether it's, and you can, you can throughout history, you can figure out like, when people are telling a bullshit story based on evidence, right? So when people are adding to the record, it becomes evidence. What is the, what is it evidence of? Only time will tell, but it is evidence. So even if they're like you say, malicious and lying, I think that a lot of times going to come out in the wash, but people want to try and convict people today or right now on Twitter in the next 24 hours, we need receipts. We're going to, we're going to call you a liar. And you can't really do that. Like, that's what I'm saying with that Michael Jackson stuff. It's like, in, it, it, when I read it, I was like, yeah, you're not really, you weren't around and I, you're not presenting all the evidence. You're not, you're just saying things that are being said today. 
you know, not, not, not in, in, in the totality of that conversation, you're not presenting all of the evidence, all of the victim stories. And when you look at all of the victim stories in that situation, it's compelling because they're all the same. They're all the same kind of story from 10 children's perspectives that never knew each other and never spoke. That sort of paints a picture of guilt. And the idea like online that you need all these receipts is sort of bullshit because our court system works where most people are in prison based on circumstantial evidence and stories, not a videotape of them raping a child. Oh, I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I, I, when there's evidence of something, there's evidence. And But you know, my only issue with some of the online stuff is it's, you know when it's a witch hunt, like you just said. It's very easy to see that the people are having a good time screwing with someone, and it's not a real thing, you know? Um, yeah. But in, in the case of – I wanted to ask you about this since we're talking about certain incidents. Do you feel there is some kind of cabal that uh, abuses and even murders children behind the scenes of Hollywood and politics? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen the lowest form of man. I've studied, I studied serial killers and the lowest form of people. I've worked in pornography. I've worked with sex workers. I've worked with, you know, street prostitutes, which you can call them sex workers, but they really are on the front lines. People that are walking the streets. And as they say, there's a saying, life is stranger than fiction. Is that the saying? Yes, it is. And it very much is. Let me tell you, let me tell you, that is true. And it is, I have been privy to information that is shocking and it would, it's just crazy. And, and so to the degree that you hear about it online, um, Probably not. But yeah, do I believe in the Jeffrey Epstein stuff? Absolutely. fucking lutely In my book, in the year at the wheel book, it's funny. We talked to this guy. Oh, what is his name? John something. But he was a guy in Arkansas. And he said he worked for the Clintons. And this is before the Epstein stuff. And he, 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 John, oh boy, I forget his name. But if you saw the year at the wheel book, you find this guy. It's on archive.org and the film of his on there. But he talks about walking into a room and watching President Clinton, uh, boning some 15 year old boy and at a sex party where he was a security guard. And, and, you know, at the time you sort of, you're younger. So I'm naive. I sort of laugh and think this guy's paranoid, but when you get older, you hear about this stuff from escorts and other people working in the sex street. So it becomes a, when I'm in that muck and I'm doing my journalistic thing and I'm continuing to study it for decades and I continue to hear the same story, same like when you hear the same story from victims of a, a victimizer, like a P. Diddy case, you're hearing the same story by multiple people, a uh, Jeffrey uh, Weinstein. You're hearing the same story from multiple people. Uh, the uh, other Epstein, you're hearing the same story from multiple people that never met. That's pretty compelling evidence. You know, like, wow, this guy had a, had his, had a fingerprint, had a pattern. These people had patterns. So, yeah, I, it's hard not to believe, but it's shocking for people who aren't that messed up. And, and bro, I don't know how many rich people you met or know. Rich people are bored. Like, they're bored out of their minds. So they don't have all this trauma of how they're going to pay their rent or how they're going to get a film made. They, don't, they can do anything they want, and they do. And they do. That's the greatest explanation for it. We don't know what it's like to be that bored. I don't Hang out with it. Hang out with them. No, nah, I don't. No, thanks. I've met plenty of them, and they, uh, I, 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 I could sniff them out of a room of a hundred people. Right, and I've been, I've worked with the sec. Like I said, I've seen, I've seen stuff with my own two eyes, and I've heard stuff from people that work in, in, like I said, the sex trade, where it's just like, wow, that is is super messed up, or su- super perverted. Like, wow, you know, like these two fellows that run an ice cream company. They both like to eat out of dog bowls and drink out of dog dishes, and that's fun. It sounds like a fun thing, but I get to hear that multiple times from multiple people. <laughs> <laughs> so their secrets aren't secrets in the underground or the outlaw culture. We all know what you did. And and again, you know, I, I wanted to clarify this for the audience, too, that had never really heard this story. There's obviously an innate attraction that you have to the underdog, to the outlaw, you are you are one, and you refuse to be anything else. I understand that, and uh, 
this is the thing that attracted you to LeVay because you understood him at his most fundamental level. Can you explain? There's a big misconception because there's a name that is um, tantamount to infamy, to the devil, to people that fear those things so much that they don't need to know details. And I think a lot of the times they don't want to know. If you were to explain the dynamic of that, and he's a great example of that, um, you're another. There are other people out there that are fantastic examples of that purity that is so different than what's being put forward in terms of reputation. If you were to explain that, how would you tell me about someone like Anton or, or a true outlaw? Oh, well, it's almost like I said in the beginning when we started talking about him. He, like you asked, what, what, how did I get on this path? And I'm like, it chose me. I didn't choose it. It, it pulls me along. I didn't, I'm not running at anything. It's pulling me. And it's like pulling me in a direction that is not always beneficial to my survival, but I do it anyway. And I know this reasonably like, wow, this is probably <laughs> it's definitely against most of what every all the main, all the uh, normies think. And does that excite me? There's a lot of emotions there. Scary, exciting. So LeVay had that same thing. Something pulled him, I, I believe. That's why he, 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 he's, he's so impressive. And that's why people, other people can't duplicate it like a satanic temple. They're trying to create something he didn't have to try. It was like magic. It was his time. It was just pulled him forward. He read the, read a certain combination of books and had a certain combination of experiences that created this. Boof. And that's sort of how my, my deal is. So to explain Anton LaVey, it, you know, it, it, he was a really like I and I explained the LaVey's. In, in general is like they come out of the sixties. He come out of the era where, you know, the black Panthers and all that stuff. And he was not much different than hippies, really cool, mellow person. But they also had this idea. Like there was also this dot, 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 or else like step on his feet and he's going to hurt you. He's going to kick you where hippies might go, Oh man, you stepped on my feet. You know, it's, you know, excuse you, you know, no, they might kick you in the nuts. You know, so there's an or else to that hit that gothic hippie that the Levays are. You know, you wash my back, I wash yours. You fuck me over, I'm gonna do it to you ten times. And he's, and that's how it is in Chicago. Chicago acts that acts that way too. And, and so, but but Levay was an artist, and he used the tricks of art to get his political message out there to a degree. You know, he wanted t churches taxed. The Black Panthers wanted Black Lives to be mattered. You know, to matter. And they were the first of that. So, so how do you describe outlaw artists? I don't think it's something. It's like the crime of obscenity. You don't know it happened until after the fact. You know, you don't create something obscene knowing that the courts are going to call it obscene. The courts have to go and look at your artwork and go, "Wow, that's obscene." For it to be obscene, and I think artists might struggle or want to be like a Levee or an outlaw artist, but they can't until someone goes, wow, that's outlaw, that's radical, that's, you, you can want to do it, and wanting to do it is, is, is probably the sure sign of failure, but you, you, like for me, I didn't know I was an artist until people kept telling me I was, and I didn't like it, and it took me over a decade to accept the term because it was easiest to use to explain myself to people, but I don't like it. And I didn't, you know, you don't understand you're doing something radical until you, I, I've been run out of towns. And I was always shocked. I was like, wow, what the hell did I do? I just did what, I didn't do anything illegal. I just expressed myself. I just did this. But lo and behold, I'm in the truck in the middle of the night with 16 death threats having to leave town at that moment right now, leave, or you're going to get hurt. And so th those were dramatic moments in my life where I was, I was pretty confused, but I didn't <laughs> what I was doing, I wasn't sitting there going, how do I get run out of this town? Let me think about the artwork I'm going to create to get run out of this town. What do I think? You know, what? I don't think LeVay was like, what am I going to do to have to put a put a barbed wire fence around my house and get my lion taken away and have to isolate myself and have to act this way? You know, what am I going to do to put myself in a cage? I don't think he thought that, <laughs> you know, and I didn't certainly think what am I going to do to do, get all this reaction? But I did something and it happened. I was sort of pretty much confused by it because I'm blown away actually by the, that kind of reaction because you can just ignore art. 
You can turn the page. You can turn the channel off. You can walk away from it. <laughs> but I guess people can't because maybe one of the main goals of a human is to control the narrative. Certainly, it looks like that when people have power, they want to control a narrative. I mean, you can. It goes all the way back to the '30s with jazz or the comic book, uh, kids comic, or whatever the comic book code was, where they tried to make comic books banned or adult right. because of influencing children too much. It was control. It was helping to shift the narrative. And some people want to control the narrative, and some people want to shift the narrative, or you know, or accidentally shift the narrative, like Levey, or even myself. You know, those are, you know, so I'm not sure it's ever intentional. It's an after the fact thing. Right. No, that was the best explanation that you could give. And, um, you know, there are people that have died for their art, as you know, someone like uh, Pasolini, the filmmaker who made that movie to assault the, uh, well, the whoever, I mean, you know, he had something to say with that and he was assaulting the Sicilian government. But now I take that movie uh, sallow, very literally looking at it like, because we just had that discussion, you know, these higher, maybe, maybe Pasolini knew exactly what was going on, you know, because if you watch yeah. that movie, that is, a, I mean, that's fucked. I've movie. seen it. And, and that I've actually seen that movie embraced and, and recreated by rich people at sex clubs and, and secret societies. They love that film. And that is something rich people in, enjoy. He was, he was documenting a truth that is unbelievable to the working class because we struggle so much just to survive. We don't have that time and leisure to go uh, lick a turd or whatever, you know, make a person lick a turd or torture people. And that, that, that kind of stuff comes out of some sheer boredom. It seems when I look at history or anything, it just comes from people that are bored. They, when you can do and have anything, you know, it, you, you, you up it. And that in porn, it, we would talk about that. I remember talking to Matt Zane about this when I was working in porn and he's like, we're talking about just having a, a, you know, friendly talk. And he's like, you don't understand the trouble I have dating. And I go, what? And he goes, I worked in porn my whole life. You know, you know what it takes to get me off? It takes a lot. It takes a lot to get me off. It, it takes a lot to excite me now. I got to have a lot of circus. It's, I can't just, you know, cause I was talking about going out on a date with my girl or whatever. And he's like, I wish I could have it so simple. And I go, why can't you? And he goes, because <laughs> my bar has been set so high. Sex is almost boring to me at this point. And so that's how it becomes. When you can have anything, when you can buy anything, you, you keep upping it. You keep going, okay, one girl, two girls, three girls, four girls, this kind of action. And that's just almost a scientific thing. It's a, it's a human, that's a human nature, you know? Serial killers do the same thing. They... It's like a Helen Morrison psychologist I spoke with on an interview a long time ago. She basically says it becomes an addiction. Once you, you, the, how serial killing is, is you, 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 you do that, you kill someone and then you become addicted to those chemicals and that vibe and you have to keep doing it. It's an addiction, just like drugs or anything. It, it be, creates these chemicals and this feeling that you need to live and relive and relive. And it's the same thing with people who become perverse in any which way, even, overeating, you know, in the, in a, you could say in a poor people world or working class world, uh, the at drug addiction, alcoholism, and rich people have those issues too. But, but a lot of times they'll have addictions that you or me cannot feed like massive cocaine addictions or, or sex addictions. And they can feed those things without hurting themselves financially. They can do whatever they want. And so, yeah, a lot of that stuff. Yeah, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Do you think that's why so many people who have overindulged um, turn to the church? Huh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know why people turn to the church. I think, I think, well, I guess I think you get so beaten down that you're looking for help in any which way you can get it, and they're willing to give you the help. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like almost a pawn shop. You get so desperate, you, you, you need some money and you go give them the wedding ring. The pawn shop gives you the money. You get so desperate, you need, you need this, you're lonely, you need support, you need a support network, you need friends, you need help. And you're ignorant and working, you know, like in downtrodden and you go to the first thing, you know, go to someone that's going to do that. And the church is like, hi, we're here, we'll feed you, we'll help you, we'll, we'll love you. And, and that they say everything you want to hear, you know. And so it's, it's like gambling or anything else, I guess it's, it's an easy, it's an easy way. 
it's it's the easy way and we as in our human nature we take the easy way out always we're going to take the shortest path to get to the deer to eat it we're going to take the easiest way to eat that deer when we're hungry and speaking of which because those certain traumas out of desperation sometimes create a scenario where you you know i mean there are people that never believed in an afterlife or the concept of God. And when they're faced with their own murder, potential murder or death, they start praying. Do you think, you know, if you don't mind me asking, how do you, what are your spiritual views? Do you, do you believe that there's an existence after this physical existence? Oh man. I remember Levate in his sitting in his kitchen saying he wished there was, he wished he had a place to go meet up with his old friends. And that's sort of, I can, I can feel that if I were, you know, 20 more years, I get to his age, I'll be, I'll definitely feel that one. But, but it's like my, my, I don't, I don't know if I, the spirituality is almost like, how do you define art and how do you define spirituality is a hard one. So it's, it's an individual interpretation. Religion, you can define religion has rules. Religion is where thought goes to die. Philosophy dies when it becomes a religion. It has rules and you can understand it and you can answer for it. But spirituality and the philosophy, when you're thinking, and you know, it becomes very individual. For me, I'm only a Satanist if you're a, a Christian or opposed to Satan. You know, you're, you're, you're you know, you're, you have some issues. You know, you're a religious person. I'm going to be a Satanist to you. But in my life, I'm an agnostic in the Carl Sagan sense of the word, where you see the pale blue dot and the universe, and how the fuck could you have any answers actually? People who are, you know, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Actually, when you look at it like that, that pale blue dot, uh, I'm blown away by the whole existence. Actually, this is wild. This is wild, man. <laughs> oh, it is. And, and so I, I, yeah. I, I wish I could answer. I wish I could answer. But but I, I, I certainly, it would not be bad to be a spirit if I could have control of that spirit. Because I like on, if I have a tombstone, I want it to say I'll get my revenge from beyond the grave. And if I could be a spirit and go get my revenge on people, I would love that. I'd be a fucking wicked motherfucker as a spirit. You feel me. You might get your opportunity. Oh, good. I, I'll choke some motherfuckers out. <laughs> like, you know, they're going to get choked out. They're going to be like, I'm going to gaslight them to hell. All these people have been gaslighting me. I'm going to gaslight them. Like, I swear I got I got six cans of tuna. It's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> Just sitting, I'm sitting there next to their wife, feeling them up. The wife is going to be like, why? I feel like I'm being felt up. That's me, the spirit. <laughs> Well, now, here's the thing. That happens. I mean, there are people that have accounts. If we could go back to that Doris Spicer account where she was repeatedly raped and there were witnesses to the phenomena in her apartment in, in California. They later wrote a book and made a movie about it with Barbara Hershey. But Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I would not be a spiritual rapist. I'm talking funny, like playing with someone's hair or feeling them up in a way that I, I guess that is non-consensual. It would be Beetlejuice. So, <laughs> yeah, more Beetlejuice. I'm more Beetlejuice. I'm not looking to, I'm not, I'm just looking to play. I, I'm, I'm not, mischievous, not total destruction. And I mean, there must be like, something, no? There must be something. I don't know. I, how, how could you know? I don't think there must be something. There must be nothing, maybe. You know, oh, I, I think if I were to think about it in a, in a reasonable way, I think it's like, you know, it's just like a, in a science way, maybe the energy dissipates. And so if we're energy, we're going to go into blades of grass. We're going to go into hair. We're going to go into the cow. We're going to go into bark. We're going to go into leaves. And when we die, our energy just goes and goes into the air and becomes maybe, you know, part of, part of the electrical storm that's going to happen across the, the globe in three weeks. And that very well might be. The only reason why I, and I don't have a finite, you know, definition for myself of whatever this is. The only reason why I contemplate sometimes is because of the, you know, millions and millions of eyewitness accounts throughout human history that people have seen things. Have you ever seen or heard anything out of the ordinary? I used to grow up, when I grew up, I would go spend my time at the, my mom's fam, the fa her family had a funeral home. And I would spend time with Uncle Jim, the mortician, going picking up bodies, and he'd get them prepared, and I'd help set up for funerals. And I'd sit in the back of the room. And it certainly seemed like, you know, but there's a vibe. So you can get, I, I, I don't know if I was being tricked into it or not, of course. I know that the, the great, great grandmother that was there, she was like 90 years old when I was eight, and she would write journals and all this stuff. 
and we'd sit in the back of the room and I would move and I might be looking around and she goes, you're a seer. You can see, you can see you're a seer, aren't you? And I didn't know what she was talking about, but if it, it, you, you feel like there's something going on, like there's, there's flowers moving that shouldn't be moving, you know, there's things happening, but again, that could be this dispersion, this the energy dispersing. I, I think we dream of an afterlife because we're so afraid of death because we're not living our life. And then there's people who are living their life that aren't thinking about an afterlife. They're not on hold. They're like jumping out of airplanes. They're fucking doing amazing st stuff with their life. And they're just not thinking about it. They're racing cars around a track and they have no concern for, for that. And I think, I think probably those people are very, a lot less spiritual than they might say. Even I think we want to have this afterlife. We like LeVay. He wanted to have a place to meet up with his friends. We all want it. It is something we want to continue because life is cool and we want to continue it. We want to think there's something else, but I think that's a bad thing to do because you're not living your life to the fullest. If, if, or if there is, or if there ain't, we should be doing everything we can right now to have the greatest time we can. And that sums up LeVay and Satanism. You have to it, it, not worry about what could be and deal with what is Satanism is close as close to the West. The, the West is going to get to Buddhism, but it is like right now here. How are we going to enjoy ourselves right now? If there's an afterlife, so be it. But right now is what I have. You know, you're not going to make any deal with, you know, anyone where it's going to be the same kind of deal as, you know, just be patient and live your life in a, in a, in a calm, cool way. And don't do every, you know, be guilty, feel guilty about this stuff. But when you're dead, we're going to give you something. No one, you know, you're not going to buy a house that way. Or you're not going to do any, like, don't worry, just pay for pay. Keep giving me the money. And when you're paid off, you'll have the house. I don't know. It just doesn't work that way. I don't, I don't it's a bad deal. No, I, I, I know there are things that just simply don't add up. One of the concepts that have been brought up to me in recent years that seems a little more believable because there's there's been clues to that is that how do you feel about the idea that we're in some kind of metaphysical game right now? And then when you die in the game, now you're going to wake up in the, the game hall. Oh, Chris, I love all those ideas. I think they're all great. You know, I, like I, I think I love tripping out on all thought. So you know, I love that idea. I love we're in the major, we're, we're in a simulation. I love that shit, dude. Like, a, a great. I'm going to have a good time in the simulation. I, my nipples feel great in the simulation. <laughs> I hope they feel as great in the other simulation too, because I know they feel really wonderful. And especially when someone's on top of them. So it's like, I want to continue to live this moment and feel great in this moment. And, and that's what I strive to do, you know, I'm hoping that I have, if it, we're in a simulation and we pass over to another dimension, I love, you know, thinking about we're living in alternative dimensions. I love all that stuff, but I'm really hoping my nipples work in every situation and my penis. I hope all those things work. I don't want to be circumcised in the other dimensions. I think that was a cruel joke. I think circumcision is a really awful thing. So I would like all my nerve endings on my penis in another life and my everything to work like it does now, like that. That's good. And I love my taste buds. The senses, my smells. I like all my senses. I want them. So I'm a spirit. I, I hope the spirit nipples work. I hope my spirit nose works. My eyes work. I hope all that works because because that's what I cling to right now. No matter what is happening, it's raining outside. I still got my nipples. <laughs> Welcome back to Off to the Witch. I'm your host, Christopher Garitano, and I want to thank you for joining the conversation tonight. It's important as an artist to find your voice and speak to the world. Art isn't isolated to illustrators. There's art to infinite forms of expression. Your life, your history, and what you do in this world is ultimately art. Step away from the influence of the trending crowd, find your own voice, and give it to the world. Until next time.